Good morning, and welcome to session number five of uh, our adult series on uh, As We Pray, So We Believe, teasing out core theology from the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, the first session we did was on the theology of creation, then we moved to the theology of what it means to be a human being made in God's image. We talked about sin in the third session. Last week, we talked about the prayer book's understanding of our baptismal identity as Christians. And the fifth topic, as we planned this, uh, was what does the Book of Common Prayer teach us about nationhood? What does it mean to be a nation uh, to be the United States of America, to be live citizens of a nation uh, from the perspective of the theology of the Book of Common Prayer. And there, there are several things I would, two things I would like to say to uh, contextualize this just a bit. The first thing I want to say is remember again, the Book of Common Prayer was was developed during the 60s and early 70s. The first reading was in the General Convention of 1976. The second reading was at the Convention of 1979 when it became our Book of Common Prayer. Uh, so the compilers of the prayer book, the theologians and the liturgists that compiled our prayer book, that composed it, were writing uh, 20 to 30 years after World War II. They were writing uh, af 30 some years after the nationalism that infected Germany and then a good bit of Europe that resulted in such horrors as World War II, particularly the horror of the Holocaust. So there was a kind of concern about the danger of nationalism that was informing the theology that was produced by Karl Barth, that was produced by uh, Reinhold and Richard Niebuhr. Those theologians were working on that, and those were the theologians that had taught the people who composed our prayer book. So they had some concerns about what would happen to the world with a nationalism or a national identity that ultimately did a terrible thing, which would be to obscure the identity of the human made in God's image and obscure the identity of the disciple of Jesus Christ. In other words, they were worried about a nationalism that would claim, that would overclaim my allegiance as a Christian. And yet at the same time, they wanted to be wonderful stewards and deep appreciators of the goodness that we enjoy as citizens of this country in this particularly wonderful land. So they're balancing that. It occurs to me that this morning, uh, as we gather to, to study together, uh, the context that we're in right now with this tremendous uh, pandemic uh, bearing down upon us, that there has been probably a dramatic shift over the last five weeks in our own understanding of what it means to be a nation and to be a nation in a community of nations, all of whom are threatened by uh, this pandemic. Uh, it's one thing to talk about our national interests and China's national interests, for example, but it's different now that we know that one common humanity is threatened by one disease that, that will um, have potential to hurt all of us. Uh, so in one sense, uh, and I think here again, we also, uh, our president has mentioned that we are at war. So, you know, five weeks ago, we didn't think of ourselves as a nation at war, certainly not as a nation at war uh, with the reality that we're living now in, in this week of, of, our, of our crisis. So things have happened since I first uh, conceived the series. I wanted us to, to work on the prayer book's theology of nationhood because, because as Christians we're living in a particularly polarized uh, 
time in our national life. And we Christians should be concerned about polarization whenever we need it because uh, God has made of one blood all the people of the earth. I think things are probably even more intense and, and uh, now five weeks later. So with that is just something I needed to stipulate and to own and to name uh, as we are doing this study. So let's get to it. Um, the topic is, what is the prayer book's doctrine of what it means to be a nation? And um, one of the ways I'd like to begin is with actually a, a verse or two of scripture. I'm going to read to you from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10, beginning at verse 17. Why did I choose this? Because in the lectionary of the Book of Common Prayer, it tells me to read from Deuteronomy on July the 4th. If there is a July the 4th celebration of the Holy Eucharist, the reading from the Old Testament for July the 4th is Deuteronomy 10. So I thought it would be good to let Deuteronomy begin to, to impact us a bit. Deuteronomy 17, For the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe who executes justice for the orphans and the widow, and who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. Him alone you shall worship. To him you shall hold fast, and by his name you shall swear. So, interestingly enough, it's Independence Day and some Christians have gathered for the Eucharist before they go to the 4th of July parade. They listen, they come to church and the scripture they hear talks about the widow, the orphan, and the sojourner among you. Isn't that interesting? And isn't that stretchy? Because from the get-go, the lectionary of the prayer book wants us to think expansively about a nation's role towards the least, the last, the lost, and the most vulnerable, which leads to a prayer, at least in my mind, to the prayer for the nation. It's found on page 258 in your prayer book. If you didn't bring your prayer book home before you got quarantined, you can access it on the uh, internet, but on page 258, Colic number 17, for the nation we have these words, Lord God Almighty, you have made all the peoples of the earth for your glory. Okay, that's a, a statement, an affirmation that is very consistent with our study about humankind several weeks ago. It is very consistent, I think, with our study about human sin because sometimes nations like individuals think that they're the center of the universe. And from the get-go, the collect says to remind us of the much more expansive God's eye view of a nation, which is always a God's eye view of a nation among nations. Lord God, you have made all the peoples of the earth for your glory to serve you in freedom and in peace. Give to the people of our country one country, so to speak, that, that God is concerned about, the God of all countries, give to the people of our country a zeal for justice and the strength of forbearance. That is a powerful phrase. The strength of forbearance. That we may use our liberty in accordance with your gracious will through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Now it also says that we could use, if we wanted to, on uh, this feast of July the 4th, we could also use a special collect for Independence Day. But this one really, I think, gets to the heart of a God's eye view of nationhood. We are a, communi we are a nation in a community of nations God has made all peoples to God's glory. And therefore, yes, we are free. 
We have profound freedoms in this country. We are so fortunate. We are so blessed. And what we must do as a blessed and free country is to live in peace, to have a zeal for justice, and the strength of forbearance. And I think the strength of forbearance speaks to the way we must behave within that community of nations, all of which are equally loved and regarded by God. In the Collect for Independence Day, we pray that we, we would use our uh, freedoms in a very specific way. I will read that for you in just a second. I seem to have lost my place temporarily, but I can, I can find that very quickly. At least I thought I could find it very quickly. Here it is. Here it comes. I apologize. July the 4th. Lord God Almighty, in whose name the founders of this country won liberty for themselves and for us, and lit the torch of freedom for nations then unborn, Grant that we and all the people of this land may have grace to maintain our liberties in righteousness and peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The founders of this country won liberty for themselves and for us and lit the torch of freedom for nations then on board. Here again, this speaks to the unique vocation of the United States is one of the first democracies or the first democracy that has lit a torch of freedom. Interestingly enough, this collect was written in, uh, in the 1970s. Uh, a lot of it certainly is, is an, important, um, an important prayer. I really like the stewardship of freedom implication in the collect. It's very interesting, though, I was thinking that as we have observed now uh, the 500th anniversary of the founding of the nation since the prayer book was composed, uh, there was a huge celebration at the cathedral of the 500th anniversary. Uh, this collect assumes that the United States begins with uh, the founders. And of course, as a nation or as a political entity, that is certainly true, but there were certainly peoples in what we now call the United States. There were peoples of this land that were here and who existed prior to the founders. And I wonder how this collect falls upon the ears, say, of Navajo Episcopalians in Arizona. Uh, and I think one of the things that has happened over the past 40 years since the prayer book has been put together uh, is that we've had a deepening appreciation of one uh, of the rights of native persons who were here prior to European settlers and also of some of the dark history of the country that we do need to own. So it's interesting, um, it's interesting that this colic for, Indo for Independence Day uh, begins with the founders. There's a certain historical reality in that, but there were people here, there were humans in God's image here before the founders came. Just something that occurred to me. Uh, there's a slightly datedness, perhaps, in the collect. Uh, I want us to move to prayer number 18 in our prayers that's in a section of the prayer book uh, where we pray for, it, it, it's in a section of prayers uh, on page 800. Prayers for our, the national life is the topic, and I want to spend some real time with prayer number 18 for our country. And here again, what we're trying to do is to tease out uh, a theology of what it means to be a nation. Now, many of you have heard this prayer uh, read before and prayed before. It has some powerful, some powerful reminders in it. Listen, Almighty God, who has given us this good land for our heritage, so that, it, that acknowledges that God is the giver of this land. We humbly beseech thee that we may always
always prove ourselves a people mindful of thy favor and glad to do thy will. Bless our land with honorable industry, sound learning, and pure manners. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. So here again, the collect, uh, the collect assumes that there are things we need to guard against as American people. We need to guard against violence. We need to guard against discord, confusion, pride, and arrogance and every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united peoples the multitudes brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues. Endue with the spirit of wisdom those to whom in your name we entrust the authority of government. Why? So that there may be justice and peace at home and that through obedience to thy law, we may show forth thy praise among the nations of the earth. And then in the time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness and in the day of trouble, and we are certainly in that right now, suffer not our trust in you to fail, all of which we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. One of the ways I would describe this prayer is, is that it is brilliantly cautionary. It cautions us as a people against those kind of tendencies that uh, will distract us from God's intention for all humanity. What would, could distract us from God's intention for all humanity? Uh, uh, violence, discord, confusion, pride and arrogance. It's a very realistic prayer. It's a very important prayer. Uh, on page, uh, on prayer number 27, we also see uh, some theology expressed in the prayer book. This is for social justice, prayers for the social order within our nation. And the prayer goes this way, grant, O God, that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move, move who? Move whom? Every human heart, and especially the hearts of the people of this land, that barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatreds cease, that our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It's as if that prayer was written last week. At least to my mind, it feels that way. What is so powerful to me is that barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatreds cease. One of the tragedies of this moment that we are experiencing as citizens of the United States of America is that even as we approach this crisis we're in with this pandemic, unfortunately, the way we approach the reality of the pandemic is very different. That the political divisions between Republicans and Democrats are so deep that they are expressed in different approaches to the reality of the pandemic different assessments about the danger we're in, different assessments about the approach to avoid the danger, different assessments that are being uh, promulgated by different governors throughout the country. Right now, it's very evident as the pandemic approaches that there are some dangerous divisions. And without spending any energy on who's to blame for those divisions, it, the prayer book, says that within a common populace, divisions are dangerous. Divisions are dangerous because they can be exploited. This is what Hitler was so good at. This is what Hitler was so good at. And, and the people who wrote the prayer book again were reacting to part of what they had seen in their world 30 years earlier. So what we want to do as Christian people who pray for our country, who are citizens of our country, we can never uh, just 
assume that divisions are a matter of fact or they will always be with us and people will tend to disagree because people are people. No, what the prayer book wants us to do is to pray fervently about divisions so that divisions would be healed for the common good. This seems very, very relevant to the moment we find ourselves in, at least to my ears. Um, prayer 37, in the same section, is also a kind of amazing, it's an amazing um, prayer. And I, I, I think uh, these are prayers for the common life of our citizenship. And prayer 37 just leapt off the page um, today. Uh, today I was seeing uh, on the news the concern that um, prison officials have, the concern that the Attorney General of the United States has about those who are incarcerated, where our jails and our prisons will become petri dishes for the, for the uh, incubation of this very, very dangerous vi virus. And there's concern that it would be wise to release people to home incarceration at this time. So we're thinking about prisons, and interestingly enough, uh, 40 years ago, this prayer was written for prisoners and correctional institutions. Lord Jesus, for our sake you were condemned as a criminal. Visit our jails and prisons with your pity and judgment. Remember all prisoners and bring the guilty to repentance and amendment of life according to your will and give them hope for their future. When any are held unjustly, bring them release. Forgive us and teach us to improve our justice. Remember those who work in these institutions. Keep them humane and compassionate and save them from becoming brutal or callous. And since what we do for those in prison, O Lord, we do for you, constrain us to improve their lot. All this we ask for your mercy's sake, amen. What a prayer. What a doctrine of what it means to be a citizen of a nation that because of human sin and weakness needs a penal system, needs prisons temporarily for the rehabilitation of those who are a threat to our common life. And yet, first of all, we need to remember Jesus the prisoner. Jesus incarcerated on the night before he went to the cross. Jesus, Pilate's prisoner. We need to remember Jesus. We know that he told us in Matthew 25 that when we visit the prisoner, we visit him. As we are living in this time, we are thinking about prisoners perhaps more. This prayer just seems so powerful and so evocative of a response of compassion and mercy. And I love one of the words in here. O oh Lord, and since what we do for those in prison, O oh Lord, we do for you. And then the next word, constrain us. Lock us up, as it is. Make us prisoners of the desire to be compassionate. Which I think is a, a, the, the word constrain is just a perfect word for the moment. That's prayer number 37. You can find it on page uh, 826. And then going to page 838, there's a really wonderful little litany right in the prayer book, Thanksgiving for National Life. It's uh, litany number five, and it's, um, it, can be, it can be used really well, say, on July the 4th or on Labor Day or on Memorial Day when we are particularly grateful for the freedoms and the blessings and the privileges we enjoy as, as a nation. So I'm going to read some of these and just lift out some of the, uh, tease out some of the profound theology that is in each paragraph. I'm on page 838. 838. The section is called Thanksgivings for National Life for the Nation. Almighty God, giver of all good things, we thank you for the natural majesty and beauty of this land. They restore us, though we often destroy them. 
Now, some of my fellow Episcopalians that I've met in places like Alaska, even though I, you know, I, I kind of question how they'd be able to pray some of the collects for Independence Day, I have no question that they would easily pray this. And the response of the people to this is, heal us. Native Americans pray for the healing of the land. It's a, it's a significant theme. And they also pray that the land would heal us as it provides what we need. The next petition in this litany goes this way. We thank you for the great resources of this nation. They make us rich, though we often exploit them. And the response is, forgive us. Here again, 40 years ago, we were worried about the potential for exploitation of the planet. Um, before that became a politicized concern for 40 years later, uh, it was the heartfelt prayer of, of all of us that we would want to be wise and faithful uh, stewards of the riches, uh, particularly, and I think it's, it, the language is so dramatically blunt. The bluntness of this particular intercession gets right to the point. They make us rich. I love the fact that the prayer book admits that. Oil makes us rich, though we often exploit them. As we pray, so we believe. It goes on. We thank you for the men and women who have made this country strong. They are models for us though we often fall short of them. And then the next, the response that the people say is, inspire us. There have been amazing, inspirational people in our history. Not only our, uh, our political and national leaders, our great presidents, our great thinkers, Jefferson and Hamilton, people like that, but there also are great prophets, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, and they are models for us, though we often fall short of them. And then the, the response, like I said, was inspire us. That comes from the word to breathe in. Inspiration is a breathing in of their, of their uh, example. Then we go on to say and pray, we thank you for the torch of liberty which has been lit in this land. It has drawn people from every nation, though we have often hidden from its light. And then we, the response is enlighten us. Here again, this is a wonderful, wonderful admission that our nation is built from a community of, of human tribes and, and cultures and nations. Um, and interestingly enough, if you look at the history of, um, of America, we have both embraced this and recoiled from it at various times in our country. When we built the railroads in the 19th century, we really were grateful for Chinese labor, and then there was an anti-Chinese sentiment that emerged. In the 19th century, one of the things that happened is a lot of Irish women were named Nina. That comes from advertisements in papers, such as Boston papers and New York City papers, that they would have a job posting, and then at the bottom of the posting, N period, I period, N period, A period. No Irish need apply. So our story hasn't been always one of the Statue of Liberty with open arms, bring me your poor, your downtrodden. We have had times where we have been very open and, and receptive as a nation. There have been very times when we have, have not, but the fact is we're, in, we're a tribe of tribes. We're a nation of many peoples. Uh, we thank you for the faith we have inherited in all its rich variety. It sustains our life though we have been faithless again and again. Um, we are a nation of 
that were found that was founded by faithful people. We are a nation that has uh, whose uh, national life uh, has been woven together from the fabric of many faith traditions, various Christian denominations, and various other faith traditions, Jewish, Muslim, and Hindu traditions are certainly woven into this. At our best, we follow the best of those traditions. At our worst, we actually can clobber each other as fellow citizens with the differences of those traditions. And, uh, and, and so it has, it has, faith has been both our, our gift and our strength as a people, but it is also can be a danger in another way that we have been divided and divide each other. And then finally we pray, help us, O Lord, to finish the good work here begun. I love that. I love the humility of that petition. We're always working to create a better society. We're always working to improve, strengthen our efforts to blot out ignorance and prejudice and to abolish poverty and crime and hasten the day when all our people with many voices in one united chorus will glorify your holy name. Amen. And then the final prayer that I want to call to your attention uh, is at the bottom of page 839, and it's the prayer titled For Heroic Service. But it begins in a very solemn way, in a very solemn, uh, serious affirmation about God. It addresses God as the judge of the nations. O oh, judge of the nations. We remember before you with grateful hearts the men and women of our country who in the day of decision ventured much for the liberties we now enjoy. Grant that we may not rest until all the peoples of this land share the benefits of true freedom and gladly, and gladly accept its disciplines. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This is a pretty radical prayer. And I don't mean that in the political sense of radical. I mean that in the Latin derivative sense of the word radical, which comes from the Latin word radius or root. This prayer gets at the root of realities that we need to be mindful of. Notice. Grant that we may not rest until all the people of this land share the benefits of true freedom, which implies that we know that all the people of this land at this present moment do not share equally the benefits of our freedom. So here again, uh, we don't mask our realities before the living God, particularly the God who is the judge of the nations, but we present both our gratitude for this nation and the privilege of being a citizen, but we're always working, we're always confronting other realities that cause us to fall short of God's dream and God's, uh, God's dream for our nation as it exists in a community of nations. So, interestingly enough, I think the way we end is also uh, part of the theology from which we began. Uh, we talked about the theology of creation. God has brought all things into being. Uh, God loves uh, the natural order and the natural beauty of, of the Yellowstone, um, the Yellowstone National Park. God loves the beauty of the Nile River. God loves, has made all humankind to be reflectors of God's glory since we all bear God's image. God uh, has made all of us with a kind of freedom that allows us to say yes to him, but a freedom that we often misuse. All have fallen short, including the people of the United States from time to time. Uh, we talk about the fact that uh, as a Christian, I live in a nation. Um, what is m my baptism tells me whose I am, uh, and then because I am 
uh, a disciple of Jesus Christ, I live out of that identity among a people that have other identities. Some are Christians, some are Jews, some have no faith. All of them are made in God's image, but I as a Christian live among them, seeing each person as a potential sacrament of God's glory and to live respectfully among them. And then as a nation, we, uh, we live cognizant of God's purposes in creation, cognizant of every human being being made in God's image, mindful of the fact that all human sin, including American humans, uh, realizing that sometimes my identity as a Christian may cause me tension with something that leadership in my nation may do or ask of me that is contrary to my identity as a Christian. And finally, when we think about nationhood, we think about it from a God's eye view that God um, is the God of all nations, not just our nation. And then our nation's, uh, our nation's vocation is to work among other nations to help be that reign of God that is God's dream. It has been so much fun to tease this theology uh, out of the prayer book with you all. Some of you have been so, uh, so gracious to stick with me through the five weeks. I have missed uh, this uh, adult series. Uh, I've missed the fact that we can't be dialogical because I, I would just love to discuss this stuff with, with many of you. I think it's so important. I think the implications of it are somewhere from important to staggering. Uh, and uh, so for that sake, I wish we could have more of a dialogue, but it's been such a privilege to, to lead these reflections and to lead them at this moment and at this time. God bless you, and we look forward to celebrating this Holy Week together um, in a way that will be uh, impacting and powerful. Uh, ben and I were just talking, uh, Jesse and Bob and Ben and I were just talking as we were planning Holy Week liturgies, and we were all so mindful of the fact that we will all remember this Holy Week and Easter at this moment in the midst of this pandemic in ways that we will never be able to forget as, a, as people. We're living in very charged, impacting times. And so I hope that our faith will actually grow. We are getting uh, sometimes more people watching uh, and in, engaging us online than we got when they were actually physically present sitting in the pews. So it's a, it's a very challenging, it's a very stretchy time. It's also a time like every crisis opens, uh, a crisis opens us up to see the new thing that God is doing in our time. So God bless you and thank you.